Welcome everyone to Us in Flux Conversations from the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University. My name is Joey Eshrick and I'm the editor and program manager for the center. Uh, every other week at Us in Flux, we publish a short story that explores themes of community, collaboration, and collective imagination in response to transformative events. Then we host a public conversation like this one to go even deeper on these topics. Our latest story was published last Thursday. It's titled, Even God Has a Place Called Home, and it's by Ray Mohaki. Ray is a poet, a writer of fiction and nonfiction, and a performer and artist based in Nairobi, Kenya. Ray has published two collections of poetry and two children's books, and her short fiction has been published uh, in many places, including Omanana, a magazine that publishes speculative fiction from across Africa and the African diaspora. We're also joined today by Christopher Rowe, who wrote the first piece in the Us and Flux series, uh, which we published back in April, a beautiful story about food systems, monoculture, and the conflict between capitalism and community called The Parable of the Tares. Christopher uh, is the author of the short story collection, Telling the Map from Small Beer Press, uh, and a middle grade series, The Supernormal Sleuthing Service, uh, which he co-writes with his wife, wife, author Gwenda Bond. Uh, and he joins us from Lexington, Kentucky. So hi, Ray. Hi, Christopher. Hi. Thank you for being here. Um, yeah, uh, so during our conversation, uh, you can submit questions uh, and comments for Ray and Christopher using the Q&A button, which you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom window. And in about 35 minutes, we'll turn to responding to questions. But please feel free to send them in any time throughout the event. You don't have to wait until the end. Uh, so without further ado, let's jump right into the conversation. Uh, Ray, can you uh, get us started by maybe just telling us a little bit about the story and what inspired it for you? So um, my story, um, Even God Has a Place Called Home, is basically a story about um, outliers seeking a different a different way when the world seems to be coming to an end so um yeah it's a it's a but it's a story about regeneration it's a story about birth. it's more than just regeneration of the earth uh more than just regeneration of the being it's regeneration of a car it's it's a re total rebirth of culture it's yeah um it's um, a story about Hani, who basically, okay, I'm giving, uh, I may be giving it away, but um, it's a story about Hani, um, who basically breaks away from society and goes, and a, a very um, technophilic society and, and goes, uh, becomes a reclusive. Um, becomes a recluse, goes, just disappears basically from everyone um, and builds and starts building life naturally. Um, an idea that is shunned. And, it, and, and we talk about, um, it also talks about religion. We talk about, we talk about religion and how religion influences different, different aspects of our being, of our lives and how you know, um, um, you know, religion and politics are intertwined, and all those things. So, Hani is having to deal with 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 gender issue. I mean, you know, um, sexuality issues, and um, dealing with you know, um, giving life and losing it. It's he, she's dealing with. Um, um, identity, she's dealing with uh, the environment, she's dealing with what she, her place in society, she's basically an outlier and all of a sudden nobody lives beyond a certain age and she's, be, she's lived well beyond that and at this, and at this point now um, at the end, almost at the end of her life or what seems to be the end of her life um, there is this what happens next? Does she find, a, is, is there an alternative to the life that is being lived and can, can she leave something behind? Um, and we see her niece come to um, regenerate the land and regen help her rebuild a community around her that uh, we live well beyond, well beyond, she, beyond her life, basically. 
and all in less than 2,000 words. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Christopher, I, I, I was really blown away by this story and everybody uh, on our team at Us and Flux was, and I know that you were too. Um, Absolutely. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about why, like what struck you about it and what themes and ideas have, have been sticking with you as we've been talking about it and pondering it together. Well, I had kind of a multifarious response because, you know, I am a writer and um, craftsman or whatever, and uh, I'm also a reader. Uh, as a writer, just that compression that you were just talking about, 1,700 words, um, I th there are seven named characters, um, some of whom have diminutives to their names, some of whose names change over the course of the story. The uh, It's an extraordinary act of of uh, miniaturization of epic, right? Um, there are aspects of fable to it. There are aspects of uh, a cutting edge, some guy just ran through my yard, uh, cutting edge uh, science and I think my fenugreek is here. The, um, <laughs> no, no. You wanna go right. get your fenugreek? Um, you can leave it on the porch. Um, but the uh, I, I, but all the aspects that Ray was just talking about the rebirth of culture, uh, religion and politics being intertwined, identity, environment, place, um, you know the sense of space, sense of place is very strong in this story, and I think that that speaks to, you know, right now when we're living in a time where, at least we are here in the states, um, living in a time where the safest thing to do is stay in one place, right, because of COVID-19 and depending on where you are, you know, the, so you don't get dragged into a black van and taken off to some place that you've never heard of or nobody knows where you're going. Um, and, you know, my enthusiasm for this story is, is, you know, boundless. The, uh, I, I mean, I just got pages and pages of notes here. And like, again, a 1700 word story. I mean, it's astonishing. It's astonishing how much is going on in this piece. And, and it can be read in multiple different ways, you know, multiple ways. You can read it, you know, I, you know, I went and looked after our conversation earlier for Ray's other work uh, that, you know, could that is related to this setting or also uses the setting, but you don't need to do any of that because everything you need for this story is right here in this story. I mean, you know, you can, it lends nuance and, and so on when you work, when you look at the other stories in this kind of, I don't want to call it a series, uh, this, this set. Limitless. There you go. Um, but for a, for a Western reader, all of the Kenyan cultural elements are, are fresh and exciting and, um, it, you know, depending on what your reader, what your reading history is. So, I don't know. Um, what was the question? <laughs> no, no, you're good. It actually brings me to something that I'll, I'll zero in on if that's okay, which is that, sure. you know, just to clarify, Ray's, uh, several of Ray's pieces of fiction share a setting with even God as a place called home, and it's a, a village called Kiawa Magira. Uh, and and I, I think we can talk about that, about that sense of place that you were invoking, Christopher. And, and Ray, I'll start maybe by asking you just what makes Kiawa Magira so special for you and what makes it such a magical or sort of crucial place to to set so much of your of your fiction your storytelling so Kiawa Magira is home um it's where my mother was my mother and her family come from um and this place is has such rich history and so many interesting stories going on just as Kiawa Magira itself, just not even in the fictional world. And the thing about Kiawa Magira is that um, it's this little forgotten place, 20 minutes away from the city, um, that during, sometime during um, urban planning, it was forgotten or not actually forgotten. It was basically set aside for, um, for uh, what's this called? For drainage, as a drainage path, because it's a valley. So, I mean, automatically, and there's a river going through, so automatically, this is where the water goes through. So, um, and these things were never reviewed. And even then, there were people living there. Um, and to just decide that you know where they live. And just 
because of that one thing, the you know this one place never never sort of developed, so to speak. I mean, in in a sense, right? It never quite developed. Um, so it's just twenty minutes away. It's still very rural um, and has these strange things happening, like. Right before the, you, you get to Kiawa Magira, uh, it would be raining and it will not rain the entire stretch of Kiawa Magira. And right where it ends, the rain, it's raining again. So it's just, and that happens all the time. So it's a, it's a bit strange. So it kind of helps along the, 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 the fantastical element of it. Um, yeah, so th yeah, just because of that, a lot of my stories find their home there, I think, yeah. Christopher, so, so you and I, you know, uh, I assume you, you haven't been to this region and, and so this is a new geography for you, a new, mm -hmm. uh, a new place. Uh, yeah, what did you get from the story about Kio and Magira? Uh, I feel like it is, it, the story has, is, is very evocative of the sense of place. Uh, yeah, and everything Ray says just kind of deepens it and lends it further, more things to think about. What I was thinking about with that, um, with the anecdote you related for the facts that you gave us about um, that weird thing where you get to the edge of the valley, you've been driving through rain, you go through, there is no rain, and then you get to the other side, it's raining again. And, you know, that remind what that, I think, uh, a technophiliac um, observation of that phenomenon would be this, you know, some kind of weird microclimate. There's a rain shadow because of this geographical feature. But what's more interesting uh, is that it's also a cultural microclimate, right? It is, in the story, it is a very different place in lots of different ways than the city where the technophiliacs live. And um, the... Uh, um, the, the narrator, uh, Hani, has escaped or, or, or fled or left or abandoned or uh, voluntarily um, the city and those ways of life to come and create a different space, an ethical space, an agricultural space, a horticultural space, and a cultural space that... Um, are very strange. I mean, they're, you know, it's, it's an odd, it's an odd place. Um, I love how one of my favorite things about the story is the, um, the instances where somebody tries to approach Hanny and the world actually prevents them. Um, the, the, the topography, the, the, the trees, you know, uh, act against them. And it's only when, um, when Anika, um, a, a buyer, what's her last name? I've been you. Um, when she gets there, she can overcome that, right? She's like, it's, it's like Superman. She's leaping over tall trees and stuff like that, um, which, you know, creates this real energy for her character and for the plot of the story. The, um, as far as larger concerns of sense of place, um, you know, there's a, I'm a Southerner. It's, I, I live in the South of the United States and there's a, there too much has been said about the Southern impulse to write about places and spaces of their own thing. And there's, um, there's an impulse uh, that I gave into when I was a young writer uh, among many Southern writers to do what I call Makna Patapa, um, which is a, I'm saying it's a mockery of William Faulkner's Jacques Napatapa County, right? We, we, we tend to, we tend to like amalgate spaces that we're familiar with into a fictional space to let to use as a location or setting for our stories. And it's usually deeply dissatisfying to, for readers because it's, um, it's not thoughtful. It, it's just a, it's a collection. Uh, it's a, it's a magpie's way of gathering facts and trying to make them into space. And what, and that is the farthest thing in the world for what Ray has accomplished here, right? Uh, in this and her other stories um, and pieces, she has she's gleaned um, the to use to use that word in the agricultural sense. 
she's gleaned what she can or what she needs from a real space, a, re a very real space that she knows tons about uh, and that is part of her family history. And th that the way the characters inhabit the space of the story seems to me to be an honest reflection of the way people in this world inhabit that place, right? I mean, they're not, you know, mysterious floating seed pods are not showing up, presumably. But um, but it's a it's 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 realism in a in a kind of social and and ethical and philosophical way. Yeah, it's you know, it strikes me that um, one of the reasons I think I was tempted to, to put you two together in this conversation, Christopher, is that you started us off in this series with a story that resists the kind of dominant impulse of Western science fiction, at least, to kind of uh, cite uh, stories in these giant megacities, uh, to move to different spaces. But, you know, the more we talk about this story, I think the more the differences between the monoculturalized, you know, U.S. breadbasket uh, that your story takes place in, and then this uh, Kenyan village setting uh, seemed to me. I think like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm glad we've been talking about it because the particularity of each story's space, even though they both participate in this sort of rejection of this like hyper techno cityfication of speculative fiction, um, there's still a huge amount of space and difference in these stories, uh, even though they share so much thematically. Uh, you know, that actually brings me to something I do want to talk about that, that, however, that does also bind your stories together, which is that they're both uh, in some ways about horticulture and food and agriculture, food systems, um, and the, you know, really intimate, but in our contemporary moment, often forgotten connections between humans and flora. And I was wondering, uh, you know, if each of you could reflect a little bit on, on what this story has to tell us about the relationships between humans and plants and perhaps in a broader way between humans and ecosystems so i feel i feel that i feel that um you know we we are evolving into a very you know uh technophilic uh society all of us i mean our kids grow up you know um in touch with technology at a very young age. And it is, it's, it's going to happen that we will, you know, decide, try to find simpler ways to live, um, easier ways to live longer, uh, what we call fuller, richer lives. And of course, that's still to the benefit of um, the one percent most of the time. I mean, right now we're looking at, in Kenya, we're seeing, um, say, wealthy individuals hoarding um, ventilators and ICU beds and things like that. Um, and it is easier for people who, who, I mean, it is easier, need a pacemaker, do you have money? You can go to India, get that done and blah, blah, blah. You get back and you're good. And it, as, as, we, as we evolve, we are going to see ourselves like finding, you know, you relying, re relying on tech are way too much to solve our problems. And at the same time, we neglect our natural solutions. And what I mean is, it's, I mean, we're going to supermarkets and we find ready food and there are people who will even tell you that they've never seen a cow, they don't know how corn grows or, you know, things like those, right? It's, it's very, it was common when I was growing up. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be even more common when my son's growing up. Um, and when we grow like that, we forget that we are natural beings. And when we do that, then we're not going to win, right? We, we, we basically end ourselves as natural beings and become something else. And we stop being human at all. Because even our emotions have been uh, predetermined by, you know, a certain app or 
a certain technology has been used to, you know, um, make us feel a certain way at a certain time. Um, yeah, basically, we're, we're, we're getting out of touch. And basically, that's, that's the, the, the entire basis of the story. Yeah, I should say for, for folks who haven't read it or, or who have read it long enough ago that they've uh, forgotten that, that, that the story features images of this very technophilic society, uh, presumably in Nairobi mostly, uh, where people uh, have a, a wealth of, of bodily implants and, and medical technologies at their disposal that are to some extent even integrated into their bodies. They're um, bioengineered, CRISPR made, uh, bespoke meals that are supposed to be you know, suited to each individual's genetics and their, their dietary needs. And nevertheless, the life expectancy is cratering in the story. And there's even these really, I don't know, gripping, fleeting images of body horror, like her, uh, uh, the narrator's brother, Matthew, has these like kind of sack-like um, uh, body modifications sort of hanging off of him that are impeding his movement and making it very labored um, when he comes to meet her in the village. I think... I was listening to Ray and um, talking about the way we rely on tech way too much to solve our problems and so on. And I think, I think the industrial revolution and the capitalism that came along with it, I think one of the lessons that they learned that those, those capitalists learned, those industrial leaders learned from certain aspects of the so-called enlightenment that immediately preceded their, rise to prominence um, was they invited technology to become a parasitic growth, to become a socio-political parasitic growth on humanity. And I think what is happening now is the relationship is reversing. I think that technology is so ubiquitous and is becoming so powerful and becoming so complex you know, nobody can understand everything in their life anymore, right? Um, nobody ever could, but but um, a I I would venture to say that a twelfth century farmer anywhere in the world knew more about her world, knew more about her world, what she was in, what she was creating, what she was consuming what she was influencing what was influencing her than any of us ever can we cannot know i have no idea how this thing works right i have no idea well i don't even know where my phone is i have no idea how this thing works but it dictates these things dictate my daily life they dictate the rhythms of it they dictate the um they dictate my relationship relationship with the wider world because all, most of my information, especially in these times about the wider world, come to me, f are fed to me in these streams uh, that have been edited for content and for tone. Uh, that, you know, I don't think there's never been a time, I don't, well, that's a pretty broad statement, but it is very, um, it is very important right now to apply critical thinking to everything that happens to you. And that's exhausting. You know, it is exhausting to figure out a food label on a, you know, to, to figure out the ingredients of some of the foods that we are offered and so on, right? I mean, I've been trying to grow more of my own food. And even with that, um, and this is a, this is a, a thread in my story uh, for us in Flux, you know, even buying seeds, you know, buying seeds, is a, you have to apply critical thinking to that because you have to know, is this a seed that can reproduce itself? Has somebody tinkered with uh, the, the DNA of this seed? And you, so you have to do research for everything to know how, um, how, how, your, how that interaction is happening. How that, you know, are you being parasitic? Are you being a host, one or the other? of something you do not want, right? And um, I think that um, Hanny recognizes that, the character in the story, she recognizes that, 
she refutes and refuses it. She and and the and her family members that are against it are almost like antibodies that the the, the technophiliac body, the the socioeconomic system, send after her to say, you know, you you can't, you are an illness, you are a disease, you are a, a growth that we must cut out or or bring back into the fold at the least. And then of course, you know. Kagendo shows up and all bets are off. You know, it's it's become it's a it's a very hopeful ending, really. And I, you know, despite the fact that lots of people are going to die at thirty three. Yeah, it does. Uh, it does strike me, based on what you just said, Christopher, if I can, that just um, the the overwhelming nature of uh, like being ensconced or, or sort of enmeshed in all of these relationships as we are in this moment, like you said, buying seeds or buying food or picking one technology over the other. Um, we're connected to so many institutions and so many supply chains that are comprised of so many institutions and so many individuals all over the world. Um, all of whom have agendas. Right. And, and they're working across purposes and, and it's, it's, uh, it's incumbent upon us uh, to, you know, to, to put in the mental labor if we want to be responsible to, to try to understand those relationships. And, you know, in this story, what we see is somebody who uh, decides to make a radical break and absent herself from those, those chains of, 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 of anonymized global connection. And she's scorned for it. I mean, that's the interesting thing, I think, too, is that people's reaction to her is not to, um, to just forget about her, but to actively scorn her because she represents uh, this almost unthinkable alternative of, of, of disconnection and self-sufficiency. And that's, and I think that's what happens most of the times with anyone who's seen as an outlier in any, any shape or form. This, I mean, even here, we have, um, we have going back to the issue of seed saving and we have a, I mean, that's a real issue that we have right now, that um, I grow organic, but I have to actively uh, make a choice to um, go, f go out there and find organic, um, other organic farmers whose neighbors have not planted the seed you know, the seed that has been widely advertised that has also been genetically modified and whose patent is owned by so-and-so. And, you know, those are things that you actually, it's, it's actually it's quite annoying that this is something that you have to consider right now, right? That um, the most available seed is not organic and organic is anything else. It's, 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 the special kind, so organic food is even more expensive. Yeah. Um, so how are people supposed to live long? So even when you're thinking, you think that you're, you're, you're I mean, you're living healthy because even uh, Mathu and, and, and the guys, when they were eating the crisper meals, they knew that this is the healthiest choice for the lifestyle that they've chosen. And it goes, it also goes, you know, it goes with, uh, social economic um, uh, uh, development, right? Um, all these things play um, play a role, right? Uh, you don't know where your food is coming from. So we've been on lockdown, and half the people in Nairobi don't know where the food has been coming from. But right now, all the one thing they know is that they're not getting as much fresh food, or they have to either actively seek out their food, um, you know, or actually, you know, consider things. Or they're ordering in, right? So if you're ordering your food in, you don't know where, who grew this and how it was grown. So you might think that you're getting the healthiest option there is out there, but you're still getting something that has been tinkered with at some point. Um, and I mean, the evolution of it is Hani's existence. It's the existence that she chose to break away from. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's just one of those, those, those things that, you know, at every, if, at every stage, even in the Bible, there were remnants. 
at in in every story right um so even with any story and any reality that we live right now there will be a few people who have chosen the outliers who have been you know shunned will will end up being the ones who carry on either the who who carry something on that is true to the society true to the community true to the natural spaces that they exist in and yeah um i think i'm rambling <laughs> yeah cool um so well that actually i mean that brings me i i think to uh oh and by by the way before i ask this question uh or, or pose this question uh i want to remind everybody uh that you can uh send questions uh and comments for christopher and ray uh anytime with the q a button at the bottom of the screen and i will urge you to please do that um because uh, we're going to turn to those questions before too long but um one of the things the story offers i think you know if i can be so bold ray as an as an as an antidote of parts to this is this completely different sort of epistemological system in life way which which uh has to do with witchcraft uh to use a word that you you've used when describing the story so i wanted to ask what witchcraft means in the context of the story and how uh the connections it implies with sort of mysterious uh, natural forces that people have maybe forgotten how to contend with and understand um, fits in alongside this picture we've talked about so far about technophilia and hyper urban living. Yeah, so um, this, um, the entire story is um, probably a spell, um, but um, maybe um, it is the witchcraft in this okay so let me start again <laughs> sorry so <laughs> um so in our society in the in in the in the society i have grown up in right um people took on christianity when it came as gospel truth and everything else all our practices, all our traditional practices, all the things that made us who we were or made our communities what they were or what our societies what they were, they, played, they all played a role. They all became witchcraft, right? So for this story, anything that is any, the otherness, the otherness being, um, we are also we also have have um, you know um, honey being queer um, and honey is, honey is queer um, she is into this pre colonial organics she is um, you know um, she's broken away and she's living in isolation and eventually grows and becomes one with the earth. That's, I mean, to anyone who thinks that that is strange, the strangest thing ever, that is witchcraft, right? And in some sense, that witchcraft has a place. That witchcraft is actually important. It's actually um, essential to our development, to our going forward because <laughs> that is a curation of who we are, uh, a curation of the things that we refuse to see, the things that we refuse to acknowledge. And it's basically deciding that, hey, you will not, um, you will basically not guide my narrative and just deciding to let it all implode or explode, whatever happens, let's see. And that's basically what's happening in the story. Yeah. Christopher, when we were talking in advance of this event, you mentioned that, you know, in the, in the colonial imagination, uh, especially witchcraft is really just, as Ray was saying, uh, religion done differently, anything outside of the dominant uh, spiritual, moral, whatever ecosystem. Um, I wonder if you could expand on that or, or talk a little more about it. 
think the way I formulated it was that um, magic is the way other people do religion. And the, um, you know, it's hard as a, you know, as a child of colonialism, as a, as a privileged Westerner, it's, it's hard to address these issues with any kind of authority, right? I mean, I, I, I don't have, you know, access to, to a lot of useful or necessary information. Um, but I can recognize, I think, and I think it's, I think it's important for any person who, you know, whatever your privileges you possess, um, you know, recognize your own privilege. That's, 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 a, that's the minimum you can do, but to interrogate social assumptions, right? You know, uh, Ray was talking about how, um, first off, the entire story is a spell. Oh my God, what a beautiful phrase that is. But the um, the way that she describes, or you described the, um, the cultures, the cultural artifacts that both in the story and in the real lived world as being threatened and um, subverted and kind of plowed under, right? I mean, they're, they're, you know, there's this kind of monoculture. There, you know, there's an outside Western impulse that comes down on top of you that like makes certain demands of even the people that it is obliterating, it makes demands of them, right? It's just like, a, I'm here to take your labor. I'm here to take your minerals. I'm here to take your foodstuffs, your, you know, everything. I'm going to take everything from you. And while I'm doing it, you must become more like me, or you must be become an attenuated version of yourself that I think I understand. Okay. And that is the way that religion plays into that is, you know, religion is the ultimate, maybe not the ultimate, but it, it is, a powerful tool of oppression and of imperialism and um you know the the way that the uh, roman catholicism you know was fantastic at co-opting um anything and everything it could into you know the the local well the, lo the spirit of the well that is in your village all of a sudden becomes a, a it was a saint that lived here 200 years ago, right? It's, and it becomes personified in different ways. But the, um, all right, religion is the way other people do magic. That's what I'm trying to talk about. Um, no, magic is the way other people do religion. I'm sorry. Uh, it's just, you know, it's that otherness that Ray was talking about. It's a way to other, of, it's a way to other. It is a way to other, the verb. And um, and recognizing the fact that it happens is the minimal first step that a thoughtful person can can take uh, when trying to trying to come to come to trying to make peace with what we've done to other people and what we continue to do to other people. And uh, all right, that's it. <laughs> To me, it implies something really radical about the relationships with the land that you two are, have been talking about throughout and then sort of knowledge of uh, ecosystems, food systems, uh, growing uh, horticulture, that that, you know, that in this sort of near future, moderate future, you know, I don't know, sort of we're, I think we're in the quote unquote future in this story in some way or another, that you know, all of that knowledge gets folded into this uh, epithet, this, this epithet of witchcraft, that, that which is unacceptable, that which is other, that which needs to be not just rejected, but made disreputable. Um, and maybe, you know, as I'm hearing you two talk, I've been thinking there's probably, there's something radically threatening to this very entangled economic and social system that we've developed uh, on the earth today, uh, if people are able to go and cultivate their own land and that they're able to uh, simplify in some ways their, uh, you know, simplify their lives in terms of the systems that they have to interact with to get the basic rudiments of, of life. I keep saying things that are not questions, so I apologize for that. I'm just... Uh, 
I just lost sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Joey, we can't hear you. Ray, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can I can hear you. Can you. Right. you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I took my hands off. Something's wrong with them. Um, so before we go to questions from our audience, I just, I wanted to ask one more question, um, which is that just Ray asking you a little bit about how you compose this story. It has such a um, distinctive style. You know, I said at one point to pick up on language we've all been using so far that it, it sort of casts a spell. Uh, Christopher called it relentless. I think it's very lush. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wanted to hear for, from you and then perhaps from Christopher very briefly about just like the, um, the, the, the style of the story, the tone of it, how you, how you approached it. So um, I, the, I mean, uh, you guys reached out when it was, when I just started working on something within that, within that space after reading or binging on um, Louis Fernando Verismo um the club of angels and he has this way of 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 um basically giving giving away the entire story without actually giving it away and then still feeding you more um throwing you more darts and yeah um messing with you along the way so it was interesting because it's not it's not the kind of story that I've, uh, it's not the kind of book I've, I've read in a while, right? So um, after reading the first one, I found the second book and then the third thing, the third thing I did was write this story, was start writing this story. So you caught me halfway and I was like, okay, this is, yeah. Um, so yeah. It's, it's, very, it's very erratic, which is, I guess, my style. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's Own very, it. very erratic. <laughs> um, it's very erratic um, and very experimental. Um, but I really, really enjoyed how much I could tell within, you know, using this style because I am, um, it's, it's, it's a coming to bath story with um, elements of, of what, of the end really, and everything in between. It's uh, destruction and regeneration all in one. So, yeah, it was kind of interesting to. Uh, it was kind of interesting to write. Yeah. I don't have anything cogent to add to that. That's that. You know, that's that. That's beautiful. The um, I did order the Club of Angels after, by the way. So I'm looking forward to reading that. <laughs> um, you will so, enjoy it. Yeah, I. I I I'm very to read that as well right because I, I think the story has a really I don't know just the way you're using uh, vocabulary and the amount of just the amount of different like arcs and sort of movements in the story and like Christopher said the amount you're able to do with just seven named characters I was glad you counted those up Christopher um, it's really fascinating so uh, I think uh, we'll take a few minutes and, and take questions from uh, from our audience and then we'll come back for one final question from me but um, First, uh, uh, we had a question, um, Ray, somebody uh, actually who is anonymous in the comments says uh, a shout out to you, an amazing writer with a mysterious mind. Uh, and, uh, and they ask, uh, are there elements of your own personality in this story? And if so, can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I guess the biggest element there is, is that I am an outlier. Um, um, organic fingers. Um, so somehow my stories always tend to have an element of, you know, um, either solitude or 
um, something to do with nature and yeah, and just strangeness. I'm just, I'm, I'm very awkward and my stories are awkward as well. So if you get through them, congratulations, man. Thank you very much. Yeah. I would never describe this story as awkward, but I do think it makes, it does make a unique set of demands. As somebody who's read a bunch of Flash recently, it makes a unique set of demands on the, on the reader to try to figure out how everything fits together. But uh, especially the more that I've talked about it with folks, just the richer and richer it seems. So thank you for that. Um, there's also a question uh, for, for you, Ray, but I'll, I'll pose it to both of you, which is how, how have you managed to stay consistent and motivated to write or have you um, in, this, in this global climate we're in with all the chaos and uncertainty uh, out there? Well, that's, that's, that's a bit of a strange one for me. So um, I have to write for a living. So I kind of have to. Um, so in the little um, spaces I get, um, basically, my entire schedule has gone out the window. I write when I can. I don't write with any structure anymore. Um, before, I used to be uh, wake up in the morning, wake up really early in the morning, like at 3 a.m. and start writing. But now I just can't. So it's... Um, some, sometime during the day as everything is rolling, um, either, between, either between work and reading, I just find time to, to write, yeah. When it happens, it happens. When it doesn't, it's all right, yeah. Um, it's hugely challenging. I mean, uh, you know, the restrictions on my physical movement throughout the world is is different. I took my first bike ride in a couple of months this morning um, and I, you know, planned my route so that I would not be close to anyone else. Um, I, you know, I, I'm lucky to have a, a, a very nice home. Um, I mean, by my, by my life, it's not huge or anything, but, um, you know, I, this spring I discovered gardening and or came to be a gardener and so my my world has kind of gotten smaller and smaller and smaller but that doesn't release me from the from the obligations I have I mean like Ray I'm a you know most of the money I make comes from writing uh and I still have to pay my mortgage and there's certain you know gotta pay the electric bill gotta pay the water bill I mean these things aren't going away um, you know, despite the, despite the crisis. So yeah, um, uh, my schedule likewise is, has become erratic and chaotic. Um, but so far I've still been managing to get work done in kind of like the nooks and crannies and so on of, of time that I can find for it. So uh, the, another question uh, from Jay, and Jay, I'm gonna, thanks for this question. I'm going to riff off it a little bit. Uh, Jay asks uh, who your favorite fantasy writers are right now and why. And it actually brings up for me, uh, that implies to me that, that perhaps, Jay, you're seeing this story as a fantasy story. And I, I would wonder, Ray and Christopher, if you think it's, is it helpful to think of this story in terms of science fiction, fantasy, other literary genres or sort of tendencies? Is it, you know, there's some sort of folklore we talked about, witchcraft. Is that a helpful way to think about this story at all? Or is it just, um, you know, is, are, those, are those kind of labels or categories um, unhelpful because they're kind of like kind of cutting off so much of the, of the space in the story? I wonder what you each thought about that. Those are marketing terms, not terms of art. I mean, I don't, I don't think that, I mean, the story will support whatever you bring to it. You know, it's complex, it's, it's you know, deep. Um, if you want to describe it as a fantasy story, the ending certainly, I guess, supports that. It's a science fiction story with the technology and the, and the wearables and so on and the crisper meals. But, you know, I mean, if it's useful for a reader to think of it in those terms, I suppose it's okay. I mean, that's fine. Um, 
I didn't, I would hesitate to put any kind of, uh, you know, I, I would hesitate to put any kind of label on it like this. It's prescriptive, right? You know, to put those kind of, yeah. to say those kind of things about a piece. And I, well, I don't know who that would be useful for, but if it's useful for you, Ray, go for it. Yeah, Ray, I, I wonder what you think about that. You know, uh, are, do, just in general in your career or, or as you talk about your writing or as other people do, do you find it useful when they talk about genre in those ways or, or do, does it just feel like it doesn't really apply or, or, or capture anything about the work? I never go into writing anything thinking that I'm writing a fantasy piece. I'm going to write um, magical realism. I'm going to write uh, science fiction. I write a story. I write the story that comes to me, right? And for this particular story, I wouldn't even know where to place to I don't, I don't even know where to categorize it. And to be honest, all my stories have been categorized for me and not by me. I just, it just doesn't work for me. Um, but still, to answer the question, um, my favorite, <clears throat> sorry, um, my favorite author right now is Nedi. Okorafor, and her description of her work is the closest that has come, that is the, is the description that comes closest to my work. She calls hers African Jujuism. And I think yeah, maybe still not quite, that maybe describes hers, but close enough. Um, for me, none. Yeah. Christopher, any authors in the fantasy space to, uh, or you know, that could be categorized that way or, or talked about that way to, to recommend? Right to now, I'm really excited about this hot Kenyan writer named Rain Wahaki that I'm really, really <laughs> enjoying. Uh, um, I guess, I mean, I always fall back on Kelly Link, um, who is, a, I must acknowledge, is a really good friend of mine, but. Uh, I was in love with her fiction before she became the the sister I never wanted. Um, the uh, I don't know. I haven't been re I've been reading a lot of cookbooks and mystery novels. Is <laughs> basically what my my reading has been lately. So I, I'm not really. I mean, I read Akata Witch, which I thought was amazing. Uh, so I'll you know I'll join in on Nettie there. So there you go. All right. Two recommendations for Nettie Okorafor, check her out. Um, okay, so uh, I'll ask a last audience question and then we'll, uh, we'll go to a final quick question for the two of you from me. But uh, Jamie says, uh, I read Hani's last act as, a, as an act of resistance and defiance initially, but later uh, thought of it as a willful surrendering to something bigger than human. Are, are these the same thing, Jamie asks? Uh, Ray, do you, do, you, do you see a connection between these two? Does one reading speak to you more than the other? Um, Honey's becoming one is more of a surrender uh, when she knows that it's like she's been waiting for the perfect person to take on the responsibility of uh, bringing on the new generation. And she when she realizes that she's not alone and that, that there are people around her, there's, there's been people working together with her from wherever they've been uh, towards the goal that she's working towards or for the li towards the life that she's working towards, then she releases herself and she's um, maybe reborn or then again, or... Um, taken over by the earth. But I, I mean, either way, either, whichever way you look at it, something transcendent happened, something great happened. And yeah, I like honey. Anything to add, Christopher? I thought you saw you perk up when she said transcendence. Yeah, well, I mean, but that's, uh, it's just the right word. And 
No, I don't have anything especially valuable to add to what the author uh, brought to it. I'll, I mean, I acknowledge that, you know, that others' opinions are can be just as important than as a, as a writer in my point of view, that, you know, other people who say things about my stories, I, I don't have any special powers uh, over my own fiction that allows me to say absolutely what it is and what it is not. But, um, you know, I, I, I think Ray Maybe spoke we, very intelligently and eloquently there. So mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that. Um, so my final question before we say farewell to everyone is, um, what does even God as a place called home have to tell us about community? That's been a theme that we've been considering throughout this Us and Flux project since Christopher's story, which was our first. Uh, what do you all think this story maybe has to, has to teach us about that? So I think it's, it's um, I think community in this story is more of like the breaking away from things that really, from the societies that don't work for you or the communities that do not work for you know, you and your greater good. Um, and, you know, um, coexistence with, you know, um, when everything ends up being in sync and that your people are drawn to you, your life is actually happening. So for me, community in this story is, 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 is more of like, um, even in the, even for the outliers, there's, there is home. Even for, 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 for things that are out of this world, there is home. There is always a place that any being, um, plant or human or whatever else, or animal, um, there is home. There is that place where everything is in sync and everything works together. Yeah. I only have a very small um, thing to add to that, and which is um, my favorite access to community in the story is lineage and kinship, right? Um, almost all the characters are related to one another in some way, th whether it's through marriage or blood. And um, I think that kinship networks you know, can exist independent of familial connections, obviously. But, um, you know, they're kind of a microcosm of the larger society that they live in, especially important when they're rejecting aspects of that larger society, as, as is true with Tani and um, some, some of her relatives. And so I, that's what, you know, like I said, that's, a, that's an appendix to what Ray just said. <laughs> Well, thank you both. That, that was really helpful. And, and Christopher, thank you for bringing up the word kinship, which was in my notes and, and something that talking to the two of you really helped me uh, think of in, in terms of the story. So for, for those of you who haven't used that kinship lens on the story, I'll tell you it's, it's, a, it's a helpful one to go back with and helps you understand the web of relationships between the characters in a way that I don't know that I was initially uh, keyed into. So, um, so thank you both. We're, we're just about out of time. Thank you both, Ray and Christopher, for joining us today. Thank you, Ray, for doing such a, a very late event with us. It's the middle of the night in, uh, in Kenya. Um, so I'll ask each of you, and Ray, maybe you can uh, start. Uh, where's the best place to find more about you and your work uh, online? Um, I'd say probably my WordPress pages, which are pretty dormant. But when there's something, there's something. Um, um, that is for poetry, it is raiseattic.wordpress.com. And for uh, prose, it's unwarrantedcomparisons.wordpress.com. Um, at the same time, um, my Facebook, Ray, wait, sorry, Rachel. In quotes, Ray Mwehaki is a place to go. It's a, uh, my Facebook page, which has pretty much most of the information. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, actually, we had a question from uh, an audience member about, do you have another book of poetry coming out anytime soon, or are you working on one? Yeah, I'm working on, a, on something um, in the horror spaces. 
So, um, let's see how the end of the year goes. Seems very appropriate. And my son is up. <laughs> uh, Christopher, where, where should people go to learn more about you and find some of your work? Not really the internet. Would that be a great place to go? I mean, swing by the house. Uh, I do have a website, um, ChristopherRowe.TypePad.something. And, um, but I don't update it very often. Um, I've got an Instagram. If you want to look at pictures of the food I grow and the food I eat, CV row one, two, three, four. Uh, that's basically most of what I do on the internet. I talk, argue with my family on Facebook about politics. Um, I'm, you know, my online footprint is, is perhaps depressingly small for a 21st century science fiction and fantasy writer, but. Well, we were saying while we were prepping that, uh, you know, the best writers I know are often some of the worst people at keeping their websites up. <laughs> if, if you haven't, if, if folks haven't read Telling the Map, um, which is from Small Beer Press, which is Kelly Link's uh, uh, Cohen Press, uh, I, I would highly recommend that book to people. Thank um, you. Our next uh, Us in Flux story uh, will be by Ernest Hogan, a uh, writer from here in Phoenix, Arizona, where I am now. And we're going to publish it on Thursday, August 6th. And then we'll have another one of these conversations in two weeks uh, with Ernest on uh, Monday, August 10th at, at, at the same time, so 1 p.m. Pacific. Um, you can find all of our Us in Flux stories and register for our events at csi.asu.edu slash us in flux. And um, really thank you to all of you for being here with us and supporting this work and being part of our community during this time. Uh, and, and thank you once again, Christopher, Ray, for, for being part of this and for having this conversation with me. And uh, I hope everyone has a lovely afternoon or a lovely evening or night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.